All right, so good evening. Welcome to everyone. Uh, thanks for jumping on board. Uh, be a really interesting topic this evening. So um, just quickly on to our rules. So if everyone can have their microphones muted. Um, session is being recorded now, so you, your camera is optional and the session will be uploaded to the Hills Football YouTube page, uh, YouTube channel tomorrow. So um, if you want to view it back, uh, clarify anything, you've got to do that uh, from tomorrow morning. And um, obviously take as many notes, uh, any photos or anything you want from your end, just to help highlight anything as we go. I'm pretty sure uh, you've all seen this page or similar before. So uh, my name is Dan Shepherd, uh, Technical Director uh, for Hills Football, and um, really, uh, really happy to be doing this stuff and having some conversation with some other people outside uh, the other three that live in this house with me at the moment. So thanks for thanks for jumping on. Um, yep, a licensed coach, all that other bits and pieces that I'm sure you've all seen uh, over a bit of time. Uh, I won't bore you too much with myself, but for those that don't know. Um, probably the one of the largest parts of my role is coach education across our uh, wonderful 20 clubs that we have in the hills um, and this is just another avenue for us to be able to provide something uh, along those lines i'm um, going to move quickly on to our guests though the the important people for this evening so first of all i'd like to introduce dr kerry peak um, who is our, our lead um the person on this on the uh, science area and the research uh, behind the was it the heading and concussion? Uh, Kerry, if you want to just uh, say hello and uh, a little bit about yourself. Yeah, so thank you. Thanks for the introduction and thanks for inviting us along to to talk to you. So my name is Kerry Peake. I'm a physiotherapist by trade, um, but I now work at the University of Sydney as a sports injury researcher. And I really got into heading from a background in neck strengthening. I used to work a lot in, in rugby in the UK. Um, and it wasn't really until my son started playing football in the under nines, watching them head the ball that I really thought, well, is this safe? Is this something we should be encouraging our kids to do? And using my background in sort of mitigating sports related head and neck injuries, looking at ways that we could make heading safer. Brilliant. Um... And moving on to next, we have Andrew Head. Andrew, you want to uh, jump on? Uh, thanks, Dan. Uh, hi, all. Uh, thanks for having us on tonight. Um, pretty important subject. It's uh, great to be to be on and have an audience. Uh, <clears throat> um, I'm basically a co-founder of Heading Pro, uh, football developer, a manufacturer, and founder of and CEO of Deploy Football, uh, Deploy Sports Group. Um, so basically my job is to come up with product that, um, that benefits the industry and uh, that's what we're doing now as far as heading pro is concerned. Most people that are on the call this evening that uh, would have experienced a deploy football over the years. Um, so you can uh, say all the positive stuff you want about deploying and keep, the, <laughs> keep it if you don't like it. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Feedback's great. We'll take it. But um, look, yeah, no, we, we're growing. We're growing. It's the support's been great from the, the local market. And uh, finally, our, our final guest to, to jump on as well is uh, is Dean. And welcome, Dean. If you want to come on and uh, introduce yourself. Thank you. Yeah, again, thanks for having us, Dan, and all the grassroots clubs. Um, as you've said, and I'm just going to read off the list here. So, co founder of Heading Pro. Uh, I myself am a former player and coach as well. Um, obviously, Heading Pro is a um, very important topic for us. And, you know, it's a passion project for Andrew and I. And uh, we basically just want to help uh, better understand what's essential for players to head a ball safely. Brilliant. So that's, uh, that's the panel for this evening. Uh... If you do have any questions, just uh, you can post them in the chat room uh, throughout and either we'll be able to address them as we keep on going or uh, we'll, uh, we will have a Q&A session off of the record at the end as well. So definitely make some notes um, either for the end or keep it going uh, in the chat room throughout the session. All right, so on to 
the uh, the plan for this evening. So we're going to talk about first of all what the science around heading is, then discuss uh, the heading pro ball and and then some some ways to train heading effectively, and uh, then our normal training essentials. I'll so change it and some summary and uh, the way you can access some some resources to help you. So those of you that were on our last uh, webinar, which was about the core skills, would probably remember this slide. So where heading sits within our space is quite simply within the strike and the ball core skill. And it's uh, one part of, uh, part of the game that is, uh, is very crucial at certain moments, but probably isn't uh, the most predominant core skill or element of, of that core skill that you're gonna come across within. Uh, a game too often um, and obviously we mentioned heading pro uh, very briefly on the last webinar talking about uh, some potential activities um, and use the, the last line there about the English FA's research on heading uh, and some on the averages and uh, we'll get some more information on that as we sort of progress but um, what does the science say uh, Dr Kerry over to you So hopefully you can uh, see my screen and of uh, slides and not my emails, which I occasionally... Yep, we've got a, yep, we've got a picture. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so I'll try not to bore you too much. This is a subject that actually I love talking about, but I know that being coaches, you'll want to, to talk to Andrew and Dean, who'll give you a lot more practical tips. So I mentioned that I got into this um, because of my son. So this is a picture of my son. So what I really want to cover today is to talk a little bit about concussion, um, then move on to talk more about heading and then look at the strategies that we've been investigating to make um, the sport safer for all of our players. So... Thinking about sort of football and concussion, so we do try to separate them when we, we, we talk about it because most ball to head impacts are a relatively low um, G force. So you're sort of looking at between sort of 10 and 22 Gs, whereas concussion sort of accepted is to be up around the 70 to 90 G, but obviously you can get concussion from much lower forces. Um, so heading itself is unlikely um, to cause concussions. What is more likely to cause concussions are head-to-head -head impacts, um, head-to-elbow and unintentional ball-to-head impacts when you're not expecting the ball to strike the head. Um, and concussions are more likely to occur in games. So this is more likely to cause concussion. And just playing this video, um, this is from the 2014 World Cup, and it really started the conversation um, with, um, uh, with FIFA and UEFA to see how are football managing concussions. So as you saw early on, the player had a knee to the head. He's obviously out cold. Um, not every concussion um, has a loss of consciousness. There's only about 10% of concussions that um, the player has lost consciousness. But he's groggy. He's unstable in his feet. This is the doctor in the suit who, um, you know, makes the universal sign for an interchange and anyway he essentially gets overruled and the player stays on and we saw a little bit of that in the um, in the euros as well um, and so it's really about how we manage concussion and most players will want to stay on um, and there's a certain number that are injured and not making the correct decisions and so we do have to sometimes make the decisions for our players and that's more important at grassroots level as well. So I won't play you this video, but if you do want to link to it, then I'm more than happy to provide it. But this was an education video that we, um, we made to educate players about the signs and symptoms of concussion and how we should manage them. But essentially the concussion in sport uh, regulations say that any player with a suspected concussion, but certainly a diagnosed concussion, um, in the, if they're under 18, should be um, out of the game for 14 days to allow that minimum recovery. And that is 14 days from the last known symptoms. So if they have symptoms for seven days, then it's 14 days after that. And I suspect that the concussion guidelines are going to increase. So it's actually 21 days, which is more in line with what they're seeing in rugby. With adults, you can actually be back within a week. Um, and again, that's from the, um, the end of the cessation of symptoms. Um, but the concussion in sport group, they're due to meet in Paris next year. And so it's likely that the concussion guidelines will change again. But generally at grassroots level, it is being ultra conservative. So is heading safe? 
So there's a lot of media reports, particularly in the UK, that is um, linking heading to higher risks of dementia. So what we know at the moment in terms of the research is that there is no single point of evidence to say that heading causes dementia or heading causes CTE. Um, there is certainly some observational studies that's, that, that indicate that this may be the case, but they don't control for all the other factors that um, may increase the risk of neurocognitive diseases such as dementia. But what we're saying at this stage is that we don't know. Um, there is too many gaps in the evidence to say that uh, heading is 100% safe. So we're taking the sort of precautionary approach that let's protect this next generation of players by putting strategies in place to make heading safer. Because if the evidence comes out later that heading is terrible for the brain, at least we acted when, as soon as we knew. So this has led a number of uh, football associations around the world to develop their heading guidelines. So the first was in 2020, uh, 2010. So US soccer, um, in response to a class action lawsuit, um, developed their heading guidelines. And so heading is banned in the under 10s with restricted heading in under 11s to under 13s. Uh, the Football Associations of England, Scotland and Northern Ireland, they released their heading guidelines in 20, uh, 2020 and then last month they um, updated their heading guidelines. So they have uh, restricted heading really until under 18s with heading um, banned in training in under 11s. What sort of concerns us about these guidelines is that you are potentially allowing the first heading experience of young players to be in a game without any technique training whatsoever. And certainly my concern is with this is that actually you may be increasing the risk of injury. So if this is a picture of my son's under 13s team, and when you're talking about head, heading guidelines that are based on chronological age, so as soon as you turn 11, you can now head the ball, or when you're 14, you can have unlimited headers, is that we know at these age groups, the difference between the, the tallest, heavier player and the smallest, shortest player is, is quite enormous, even though, um, you know, chronologically, they're the same age, but biologically or from a maturation perspective, they're not the same. So we think there's a better way. So I was very fortunate to be part of an expert panel who presented to UEFA when they were developing their heading guidelines and they came out um, in May last year. And so rather than talking about heading restrictions or bans, what they actually are doing are putting a framework together to reduce the amount of heading in, um, in young players. So taking out unnecessary drills, making sure that if players have done a lot of heading in games that they may have a rest throughout the week, um, having you know, very short sessions of heading, but also using you know, smaller, lighter balls, looking at the evidence for neck strengthening and just increasing concussion awareness. So the Japan Football Associations in May 2021, they also released their heading guidelines, which are very much along the same principle. I don't know what FIFA's um, idea is in terms of their heading guidelines. And um, Football Australia, um, I'm part of a, a group that are also putting together the evidence summary. So we're expecting those to come out hopefully in the next six months. So what happens when a ball impacts the head? So if we think back to our sort of early days in physics, that what you see when a, uh, the ball strikes the head is that all the momentum is transferred into that player's head. And if this video continued to play, that ball would become stationary and it actually dropped to the ground because it's lost all of its momentum. So if we look at... Um, this is probably an unintentional head impact, but when we're talking about low effective mass, we're talking about the head being connected to the body with a strong, stiff, activated neck. If the head is fairly loose on top of the body, you'll see a lot of head movement. And what we can sort of extrapolate from that is the more the head moves, the more the brain is going to move. So if we look at a, the master here, and a, a header from Ronaldo, and this is in slow motion, so it'll probably take him about 40 seconds to actually um, make contact with the ball. But, you know, this is what we're trying to teach with young players is that even if they're not jumping, because this is quite phenomenal, but, you know, being able to track the ball with the eyes, being able just to, you know, anticipate the tra trajectory and know when it's going to contact, keeping your eyes open until the very last minute. So as the ball does make contact, you know that you can use the forehead, which is the strongest part of the, the skull, and it also will help to increase the accuracy of the header. So the great thing about this is from a, a medical perspective, 
perspective that if we can make heading safer, we can also increase the accuracy of heading. So that's a win for us and it's a win for you as coaches and players. So we put together sort of a, a five point heading plan, which is really looking at the strategies that we can implement really in the short term to, to protect the generation of players that are playing football as we speak. So um, in the last 18 months, um, my team and I have published um, seven studies, which um, is just looking at um, the different strategies. But we've also been um, publicising a lot of our research, talking to UEFA, talking to Football Australia. Um, Dean and Andrew and I have, um, have done some podcasts, talking to the professional football um, in Australia, um, coaching conference, uh, some radio presentations, been on the news and in the media. So it's like basically trying to spread the word because otherwise the messaging that's really getting across are really being guided by what's happening in the UK. And we do feel that there is a better way. So we did some research in the, the lab. So I'll just shame Andrew because this is a, a picture of him heading and maybe Dean can tell us whether he actually has good technique or not. But it, it's really trying to break down um, sort of heading techniques so that we put all these markers on the body to see, well, how does the body move? What's moving first? Where are the arms? And it's much easier to see it when we're looking at sort of biomechanical models. Um, also looking at um, our heading jewels as well when players come together. Um, again, to see how do they position, where do they initiate the movement from? And this is really trying to break down that movement so that we can put it together into a, a coaching or technique framework. So exposure. So it is about limiting exposure. So we've conducted some research with um, young players. So we, we know in under 10s to under 12s football here in New South Wales that are under 10s, not everybody heads the ball. But by the time you get to 11 and 12s, everybody in the team is heading the ball. Um, and um, we know that the rates do increase with age. But we also do know when you take account of game time in young players that actually the under 15 boys and the under 17 girls actually head the ball more per minute or per minute of match time compared to the under 18s or the under 20s males so it, it's easy to say that there's not a lot of heading in young football and that's sort of true but when you actually account for the the limited game time and also taking into account that some players head the ball much more than others so if you're playing in a, a defensive position or in midfield you may head the ball six or seven times more than some of your teammates so it's not evenly spread across the team so we do have a duty of care to those players that head the ball a lot. Um, so, so the way that you might um, uh, tackle uh, training is to take out any unnecessary heading drills. So juggling with the head um, doesn't um, translate to any match play whatsoever. Even if you're thinking about, you know, head tennis, that's okay to bring sort of heading into the game, but also having it as a drill that you're also using, you know, different parts of the body as well, rather than just head to head. Um, limiting practice if players have headed the ball a lot during the game, using appropriate balls, and Andrew will talk about this in much more detail. And we do know that um, limiting headers from goal kicks and punts can reduce heading burden by 27%. So what I mean by this is that the really high impact headers that are going to have a much higher G-force come from headers from goal kicks and punts. A throw-in has about a third of the impact force that from a goal kick. Um, corner kicks are also quite high impact headers, but not so much in the younger kids' um, football. And so if you can encourage players to play out from the back, we also know that less heading takes place in small-sided games so that there is a push towards having more sided, small sided games and younger players, then this also reduces heading burden without ever mentioning the word heading ban or heading restriction. So this is just a framework that I put together based on the, the Japanese um, heading guidelines. But, you know, thinking about that not every heading drill has to include a ball. So if you're teaching trajectory, you can do that without them actually heading the ball at all. They can catch the ball. Um, and I remember talking to a coach who was telling me about Sam Kerr, that they, you know, she's an awesome header of the ball and she has amazing technique. And her background was in football, um, AFL. Um, and so she is very good at tracking the ball, but she would have been catching the ball. So this would have been the first way that she trained to head the ball with probably without even realizing but even just doing things like heading with a, a balloon at a young age you know these are all foundations towards heading without actually making that ball to head contact so activation, this is really now into sort of my area of research so what we know is that 
you know, we'd want to reduce head acceleration because the less the head moves, the less the brain moves. And that is about having a strong, stiff, activated neck and particularly in the neck flexors. And young players and females generally have um, weakened muscles. So they have a lower effective mass, a bit like that player that was moving their head a lot in the first um, um, heading video. So we really want to reduce that amount of head acceleration. So we conducted a study, which um, hopefully will be published sometime in the next month, where we implemented these exercises to part two of the FIFA 11 plus they take 30 seconds there's three variations of them and it's it's really getting the player to stop their head hitting the ground so they have to do really quick control of their neck flexors so we term this a neuromuscular exercise rather than a strengthening exercise but it's really that dynamic contraction of the muscles um, to really get them to stabilize on heading um, we used to use a lot of head harnesses when I was working in rugby and I have done some work with the Waratahs where we've looked into that, but here's Sergio Ramos doing his, you know, much more advanced version of the, the exercise that you saw my son doing in the earlier video. I don't know that you need to do it with his shirt off, but I guess it gets a few more likes. Um, and so equipment. So just before I hand over to Andrew, so this was a study that we had published at the end of last year where we used a, a, a collection of different balls um, and um, we measured head acceleration in young players, male and female, between the ages of 12 and 17. And so the, um, what this graph shows here that this was a super light ball like a ball you'd buy from a garage you wouldn't necessarily play with it but again you can see a super light ball it does have much lower head acceleration than a, a standard size five match ball that was only um, up to five psi in terms of pressure this is the heading pro ball here number three and again it's not that dissimilar from the the um, garage ball even though the garage ball was about 150 grams lighter and then this is the match ball here. So you can see even from a throw in, which was, you know, thrown in from a, a professional sort of um, a licensed coach, um, they're exactly the same speed, but you can see it's much, much lower by using the heading pro ball. So that's, we, we know that that's going to be a bit safer for the players. So even just with your match balls, if you are going to use them for training, you know, it, it's looking at, do you have to pump it up until it's really firm? Do you ever use a pressure gauge? Because the International Football Association Board has ball pressures, which range from 8.6 to 15.8. Um, and we know that even just reducing them to the lower end of that regulated ball pressure will also reduce head acceleration by about 20%. So that's an easy way to make um, head acceleration um, reduce during normal match play and I will um, pass over to Andrew. Uh, thanks Kerry, um, well said once again, uh, extremely knowledgeable on the whole situation and uh, it's, it's been great to, to work with you in this space. Um, from my part, uh, I'm the ball manufacturer essentially, uh, product developer. Uh, I'll tell, we'll just talk a little bit about how it sort of came to happen between Dean and myself. Um, and then we'll get into a little bit about the ball and then Dean and myself will come in and Dean will come and show us through some drills uh, that we have on our website currently, just a bit of an idea on how we should be working uh, and coaching education. Um, <clears throat> so from our part, myself and Dean, we're pretty much like uh, brothers, I guess. And, you know, since... Since birth, we are, since we were born, we lived over the back fence and our families are close friends and we played a bit of football together. And I since uh, watched Dean and his career uh, do very well for himself and uh, enjoyed watching him do so. But um, I took a different path, played some football when I was younger, but um, got into figuring out how to manufacture footballs and coming up with a product and, and brand myself. And um, a few years down the track and now it's a few years ago, three years ago, I would say, Dean, uh, that Dean came to me and said, mate, we need to make a light ball. Um, my kid, I'm not, I'm not teaching my kids to head consistently without using a light ball anymore. Uh, Dean had had some issues with concussion in his time and with his professional kick career. It, um, it, you know, had, it had to head quite a lot of balls in training um, because if you're going to play with the, you know, if it's going to be in the game, you need to educate. So on the back of that, it was like, okay, well, how do we come up with, we need to make it light, we need to make it soft, and we need to make it as playable as possible. 
So you can replicate somewhat of a ball, um, a match ball. Uh, so that was my job then to put the ball together and come up with a few different um, uh, prototypes, uh, get them to Dean, test them in the field uh, with some kids, with his kids majority, um, and make sure we got some sort of flight that was consistent uh, and a weight to softness ratio that would, would actually reduce um, the impact and head acceleration uh, while heading the ball and actually, you know, be safer, essentially. So uh, that's what we did. We did a bit of testing. We came back and um, we got the ball ready to go and wanted to do it through Dean's contact uh, with Peter Hugg at Football New South Wales. Um, he introduced us, we had a chat with Peter and he introduced us to Kerry, um, who had been, luckily at the time, it was a bit of timing, was uh, putting together heading research uh, out at Northern Suburbs Football Association there where, um, where they were actually in field testing so we were lucky enough to meet Kerry uh, and put our ball who accepted putting our ball into the process um, as you saw in the graph before uh, to see how it would come up um, for us it was the last leg uh, of, of our little journey as far as yep we were happy with where the ball was at um, but the be all and end all is making sure that it tested accordingly <clears throat> and met with excuse me and met with you know, a, a considerable percentage off uh, and reducing that head acceleration and impact. Um, so, yeah, basically it's, uh, it, it, we've come up with a heading pro. Um, it's lighter, it's softer. The balance and weight ratio is effectively 30% to 50% reduces head acceleration and impact. I think it's up to 50% now. Um, it started out as a size four uh, for youth football. Um, and essentially using materials a little bit different to the normal football, but specifically for heading education. So uh, we had to come up with a few prototypes that, that actually work for the cause. And that's basically what we do. Our idea was to come up with something that, that benefits the market uh, and, and helps reduce that, that's, that um, interest. For myself and Dean, it was about um, how can we help uh, and make the game safer? So that was where that landed. I think we might pass on to Dean now who come into it um, with some heading drills. I'll bring up the screen shortly. Uh, one thing I will say is before Dean comes in is that it's about not just about the tools that you use, it's about exercises, technique. And if you've got to use, if you've got to head the ball in a game, why not educate? Because we want to make the, we want to make the game as safe as possible. And if you don't know education, and you don't have the technique, then you're putting yourself at more at risk once you get into game day and game time when it, when it comes time to head the ball. Um, so that's where it all comes together. Uh, Dean? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. I think, um, yeah, you've explained that timeline and the journey so far really well. Um, again, it's it's one of those things, and as, as Kerry's already mentioned, to protect the next generation. And when I talk to players, um, the same age as me and, and sometimes older, we all say the same thing. It's, it's probably too late for us. Um, you, you know, if you've had the ball too much or not, I think I'm pretty safe because I was a defender, but I wasn't good at heading the ball. So I did whatever I could to stay out of that. And I was very well aware of the swinging arms that are involved in that as well. But um, unfortunately my concussion came during retirement when I, uh, put my hand up to play in a charity match against the Man United legends over in Perth. And that was probably, so to speak, what sparked the the journey that we're, we're kind of on at the moment and got us to this point. So, um, yeah, as I said, it's it's probably too late for some players, but as Kerry's already mentioned, we can, we can help and protect the next generation. And um, I think this ball is a, a massive part of it. And I guess the main goal for us um or the main goal for players i feel is that they need to be comfortable and confident when they head the football um timing and technique is something that has been mentioned a few times already um timing can be learned from so many different things from throwing a footy in the backyard throwing a tennis ball catching a tennis ball balloon playing afl like sam kerr did so there's so many different ways you've just got to be creative and um, I'm sure all the coaches on here um, have that in them in terms of, you know, progressing sessions or 
just finding more interesting ways to be able to engage their players and um, to do that with heading. There's so many different ways. As Kerry's mentioned, you've got balloons as well. So a few different things. Before we start the videos, um, I just want to talk about the, the common mistakes that we, we probably see more often than not on a Sunday afternoon. You definitely see plenty of it at our over 35s games on a Sunday. Um, when people head the football, you, you'll see the eyes are closed. A lot of the time, the primary impact would be the top of the head because they're kind of jumping into the ball with their shoulders hunched up around their neck, mouth wide open. Um, probably didn't judge the assess the flight of the ball as well as they could have, which is why it maybe hits them on the top of the head or um, things like that. And having those arms down flat beside um, your body kind of doesn't really protect you from other players and, and what's going on around you. So there's some of the common mistakes that we all would have seen so many times um, when we're down watching a game of football at any level. Um, if we want to start the videos, please, Andrew, so everyone can stop looking at the beach behind me in <laughs> lockdown. Thank you. So we'll start off with the seated headers. Um, uh, these are a, a short series that we came up with just to help coaches um, it's more of a introduction to heading. Um, you know, as Kerry said, you want the first exposure to heading to be in a controlled environment with an experienced coach. Um, and you can see from the pictures and the coaching points here, I won't read through them. I'll, I'll pick out one from each. Um, I guess this looks not too dissimilar to what Kerry had in there with her son doing for the neck exercises um, and the strengthening. So potentially you could do 10 or 20 without the ball to get those neck strengthening exercises involved. Then you could progress to a catch coming up and just catching it in front of your forehead. And then maybe on that last set, you can um, add the ball where you're actually heading the football just in terms of guidelines and how often you can head the ball and um, across the world, what different associations and federations are doing to make sure that um, you're not overexposing um, to the amount of headers, headers that you do in training for your young players. Um, so that's simple three progressions there that you could do one week. Um, and then the following week, uh, we're back to seated headers. Here's a name that uh, just came out. Need to go to kneeling headers. I think we're back on target there, sorry. No worries, mate. Good work. Went to YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> it's all about technology these days. Yeah, yeah. So now you can see my son closest to the screen, loving life on camera and practicing his headers. So we'll get another shot of those just after these coaching points. Um, again, arms out for balance and power. That's probably the most critical. Maybe not so far in front there like that, a little bit to the side as well. Um, my two nieces are doing a fantastic job there. But again, primary contact with the ball, obviously the forehead. You want to try and look through the ball, leaning back, coming forward and meeting it and using your arms as leverage almost and as protection um, for what's happening around you. This is something we're really proud of. The heading pro three A's, the most important part. You can continue on, Andrew. It's all good. Yeah. Um, assessing the flight of the ball, as I've already mentioned, arms out as well. As we just go on to the next one, just jump back in. So the standing headers are obviously pretty self-explanatory also. Um, but you see that the common movements are all involved in each of these drills and we're just step by step working our way up to a full um, action header. Um, now again, feet place, foot placement can be one in front of the other, can be side by side, but you can see it's all about arms, a strong trunk, strong neck, coming, meeting the ball, primary impact with the forehead, looking through the ball. And um, again, it's just getting that confidence and um, being comfortable heading the football. And again, there's the three A's at the end of it. Assess the flight of ball, arms out and attack the ball with a strong neck and core. Um, so you can always add in the core work before each session anyway, um, which always helps with everything. Um, and the strong neck um, exercises that Kerry has shown. 
you can see in any of these headers, including these ones here, um, again, just being creative. Now, putting all those actions together and adding in a jump to be able to, um, you know, make good contact with the football as well. Again, it's another step in the progression. Um, this is one where you could do 10 for each player where they just catch the ball before actually heading the football. So again, you're not overexposing to the amount of headers they're doing at training. Just because it's a lightweight football made by Heading Pro doesn't mean you can head it 100 times a night. Um, you'd want to just pick one of these videos, get creative, figure out progressions, figure out ways to work on timing without heading it. Um, and you'll find that um, your players will really benefit from that. This is redirecting headers. So one that's not a lot of impact as any player or coach would know as well. You're almost just redirecting it um, in one, one, from one side to the other. You can see foot placement is important. Um, assessing the flight of the ball is important. Service is important as always. Um, you're only as good as your service as some might say. And again, there's your key coaching points for each of the exercises. And you'll find assessing the flight of the ball is often in all of them. And so is um, the primary contact with the forehead. Um, you can see this is the first time these kids have done any of these exercises. Um, you know, anyone that's coached these age groups, you, you all know how, how keen kids are um, to start heading the football. And, um, you know, as long, that's okay. As long as we don't do it too much, it's a controlled environment as we've spoken about. And again, um, you know, we're not overexposing to that um, contact with the ball. This is a good one for defenders and defensive headers and, and just again, judging timing. So really basic, this one. So if you've got an older age group, you could maybe have that player in, in front um, stepping back to head the ball as well. And the defender behind the player who's stepping back using their body and their arms to hold their position. So the player in front walks into their arm and then they're able to step back and head the football or catch. So again, always think, how can I get the same action without heading um, on each of these drills to make sure that they're getting the timing, they're getting the balance, they're getting all the movements without the actual contact on the forehead. And then you just finish it off with um, the 10 reps with the lightweight ball. And who doesn't want to finish off with some shooting? So some attacking headers, um, again, pick different angles. This is just one that was, um, you know, obviously quite simple for us to look at. You know, you often hear, um, again, they're your, your main techniques, but when you're talking about crossing and, and attacking a ball to score a goal, heading the ball back where it came, back where it came from, often exactly like my niece has just done there, it was a great header, but that, if you try and kind of flick the ball, then you're often going to miss the ball or miss the goal completely. So if you try and really head it back where it came from um, with a strong neck and core, obviously you've got your movement and momentum from running forward, which is also going to have that power. And depending on the cross as well, whether you're redirecting or you're actually putting some power on it also. So when you head the ball back to where it came from, um, often, you give yourself more of a chance to hit all areas of the goal. If you try and flick it to the opposite side where the ball came from, you're a bigger chance of not hitting to target. There's the heading pro three A's. So that's our introduction to heading. So basically I think the key takeaways would be how can you do the exercise that you've chosen for your training week with your players? How can you do it without actually heading the football? and try and get as many reps as you can for that. Um, how can you do it by catching? And then how can you do it to finish off exactly how the video shows? Now these are perfect, as I said, for an introduction to heading. We're gonna have more, um, it's, it's up to your coach, but we are gonna have more for youth and 18s and over. Um, it's just about judging where your player's level of development is at. Um, again, that photo is quite telling, you know, with, with Kerry and early developers and slow developers and, um, you know, what, what player is a defender? How many headers did they do in the game? 
Okay, so my centre back headed the ball 10 times in the game. So I'll probably just give him the week off from headers. He can just do the catches and the timing. Um, the strikers did five. Maybe they can do a couple, couple less than everyone else, but they can still get their head on the ball a little bit in training. Just um, really just thinking outside the box and always having player welfare at the top of the list and um, and you can't really go wrong from there. So that's probably the most from me um, in terms of the coaching side of things. Um, I'll throw it back to, to you, Dan, to wrap up and see if there's any questions from everyone. Great. Thanks for that. Um, very informative uh, information for us there. Um, get to um, see some some good variations of what we can do rather than just um, just what we we've done perhaps in the past. So that's um, that's the heading pro, and that's uh, that's some techniques and some some training elements for it as well. So it's um, it's not just trying to sell a football uh, to you guys. It's also about trying to sell some education that's going to be useful for your players um, going forwards as well. And hopefully um, you might have a future Sam Kerr coming out of somewhere and someone that's going to score a few headers. So we've uh, done all right in Australia with Tim Cahill and and, uh, and uh, it's good Sammy Kerr. There's some good headers across the game. Um, all right, so moving on as well. So if uh, any of the coaches do want to grab themselves a head in pro, um, headinpro.com.au is the website and uh, just go and click buy now and then you can order yourself uh, one there as well but um, we will also have one uh, uh, the opportunity for clubs to purchase them uh, through a, a, their normal deploy order as well Andrew if you want to talk slightly about that one uh, do you want me to chime in with that now yeah yeah uh, so, yeah, we're going to deploy. We'll be sending out the football orders for next year. But really, this is all about education, really. We'll put the heading pro out for, for clubs um, if they're interested to purchase along with the, with the balls for next season. Um, if anyone industry wants ball retail now, they can go to headingpro.com. Oh, sorry, .com, not .com, .com. No, not .com, .au, yeah, .com. Um, and they're up there. We do have stock available, um, but for clubs, it'll, yeah, if there's, obviously it's a bit hard now in Sydney with lockdown, but um, anywhere else we've got stock available and we'll have some more stock for pre-order come uh, February, March. Um, can't stress the education side of it enough, to be honest. And they're not a ball that can replace your normal training ball. It's just something that you would just, only need sort of one or two um, for, for your team bring them out for just the training aids for your heading component and then that's it um, put them back in the bag from there yeah correct it's um it's it's an it's a training tool so um not for game day as yet we'll see what happens down the track and how how that plays out we've um, obviously got to go through regulations etc um, but for now it's a it's a heading training aid basically, to go along with the education and the exercises, as uh, Dr. Kerry's mentioned, um, they all work hand in hand. So coaches should be treating it like a, a cone or a pole, just a new part of their training equipment that they use at a certain part of the session. And then uh, once they're done with that, then that can be moved to the side and they can just get on with the rest of, of their session. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And if I'll just jump in there um, in terms of session planning for the coaches, if you do only have two with your kit and you obviously have a lot more players than that um, within your warm up, I'm one that likes to do circuits and have different areas and different players doing different things for that first 15 minutes. So that's maybe a good idea. If you are incorporating the heading for your particular session that it might just be one of the stations that players are at for that little period of time. So, um, you know, you, obviously you don't have enough footballs for everyone to be doing the heading. Um, and that's maybe one way to help out how to um, incorporate it into the session. Great. So um, training essentials we've covered in, in every session that we've done so far. Um, talking about the four uh, key components that we need to have in every single training session that we deliver out in our, uh, in our coaching environment. Um, 
and probably uh, one of the ones that really been hit on uh, this evening is that safe and uh, making sure that we're educating through technique and through delivery that we're not wanting to to work on some some heading so we're going to throw a ball for 40 meters and and hope that this 12 year old's going to get on the end of it uh, we're going to deliver something that's uh, safe uh, relative to what they need in their game uh, relative to their skill level as well um, the organization has helped with some of the planning but now that you've got some good access with videos to, to help you with some planning around what we do and then um, enjoyable and engaging obviously if it's not too enjoyable it's probably not going to be too engaging uh, but how we can make uh, something like that somewhat more engaging uh, in most activities we want to do, try and reduce how many players we've got standing in a line, how many players we've got um, all running around uh, and being a little bit chaotic. So making sure that it's it's controlled but not boring because uh, once it gets boring, then we start to risk the, the safety element as well, which we need to be very cautious of when we're, when we're doing heading, uh, which we've uh, discussed a number of ways this evening. And then on to our so change it. Um, so you can use different areas of this to make sure that we can help make our session effective. Um, and obviously E for equipment has been a big one that we've mentioned this evening. And then for you in your uh, coaching style, in your organization, uh, in your game rules, uh, how you're going to manipulate things like that. Um, but probably the, the amount of repetition is uh, probably being highlighted a little bit more for your education now in terms of how often uh, we should be thinking about this. Uh, I know I've, in the past I've done set piece training on a Thursday night, last part of training, and we, we do the set pieces until we're happy and uh, not really thinking about how many impacts we've possibly had. And uh, the tall guy that's defending the six yards area is just heading away all the time because the delivery is not quite good enough or whatever and haven't really thought about what impact that player is having. Uh, I have thought about my own selfish needs on what I want to achieve, first of all. So um, just being a little bit more open-minded will be a, a good start. And then our summary. So quite simple, uh, wrapping up everything we've gone through this evening. Uh, first and foremost, coaches need to be sensible. Uh, sensible in what you want to deliver and why you want to deliver it. And then what you do deliver, ensure that the players have correct technique. Uh, don't just go and look at getting uh, 50 headers done. Uh, how we can get two or three headers done with correct uh, technique is going to be more, more beneficial uh, and starting out with uh, a low baseline in terms of uh, the quantity. Safety is paramount in terms of headers. Um, Dr. Per uh, Kerry has gone through um, some really good detail there in terms of what facts we know about heading uh, and the stuff that is slightly unknown. So if we're unsure, we, we do err on the side of caution to make sure that uh, our future generations are, are going to be well looked after uh, going forward. And then the last one for me um, is the relevance, that if I do have a group of under sevens, um, do I need to be worrying about heading? And the reality is I don't think an under seven does head the ball. Uh, my daughter plays under nines, and I think across what was the season that just happened, I think you'd be lucky to see two headers across the entire season in, in her division. So the reality is that her team probably don't need to worry about hitting across the season because it doesn't happen often enough in a game. And um, if I'm worrying about the two or three headers for that team that happen, um, then you should have ticked off a lot more things in your coaching before you get down to heading. And there's a lot more core skills that I as a coach could influence far greater and improve their development as a footballer before I get to heading um, within that uh, part of, of my training. Um, so just making sure that we're aware uh, of all of those. Some resources for all of you. So um, these are pretty consistent across uh, all our webinars. Uh, and obviously they're in the bright yellow box there. We've got the website for those. We can access those uh, tutorials that uh, Dean just took us through. And that is the end of our webinar uh, this evening that we've had with, uh, with heading, um, the pros and cons of it, the, what you need to know, and then the, the training aids and uh, the, the tutorial. So hopefully you found it uh, beneficial and um, thank you all for attending. I'm now gonna stop the, 
stop the video and we'll be able to um, ask any questions that you've got.